Anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Albert Einstein. You're listening to Parenting in the Rain podcast, episode 50. Welcome to Parenting in the Rain, insights from the experts podcast, providing parents all around the world with valuable knowledge to help with the biggies of family life. Here's your host, a registered play therapist, education specialist, parent coach, and my mom, Jackie Flynn. Hi there, Jackie Flynn here. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Parenting in the Rain podcast. This episode is a very special one. It's episode 50. It's the last episode before we transition over to Play Therapy Community Podcast, which I am crazy super excited about. And I'm going to do 50 episodes of that one too. So that's still looking at similar issues, but more so from the therapeutic perspective. So a lot of the listeners will be child therapists and people that help children in that realm. But if you're listening now to this one and you are a follower of Parenting in the Rain, I am sure that you'll like that one as well. Well, let's just dive right into what the podcast episode for today is all about. It's all about when our children make mistakes. Mistakes are part of our humanness. And I sure make my fair share of mistakes. And so does everyone. They're actually a gift. They are bound to happen from time to time. In fact, mistakes need to happen for us to grow and develop as human beings. For our kids, allowing them to make mistakes can make all of the difference. As parents, it is super helpful to just allow our children to make mistakes to really teach them about life or to let life teach them about life, the experiences. It can be difficult though, especially if you're in a rush and you need to get out the door to get to school on time. I know that can be tough. Mornings sometimes are one of the hardest parts of the day. Um, You may be tempted to just go ahead and dress your child or tie their shoes um, or make their bed for them because it maybe it'd be messy if they made it or just let them have whatever they want just for the sake of getting out and everybody being happy. So I know that has its value too, but you really want to grasp those opportunities to let your child do things for themselves so that they have that ability, that confidence, that problem solving know-how when a life comes at them and you're not there or as they get older, and they need to have those skills. Uh, The list of what we could do for our children goes on and on, because sometimes life just gets so busy, and we're just tempted to do it, get it done, and be on our way. Really choosing that path of least resistance. It can be so tempting. I know this, because I've been there. (laughs) I've been there as a parent and sometimes I'm still there and I work with many parents and many families so it's just human so if this sounds like you doing stuff for your children that they can do for themselves don't beat yourself up over it but recognize this as I'm listening to this podcast episode and this is an opportunity for me to help my child grow and develop and be independent. Parenting, though, it can be so exhausting and it can feel defeating sometimes. And I don't think that's um, new information for some of you because sometimes it can be really hard. Definitely has its great moments, has amazing moments, but it definitely has its its tough moments, too. So um, I'm not saying that you never need to help your kid again. In fact, we need to be supportive to our kids. But give them a chance to nurture and develop that independence on their own. But be that helpful support in a different kind of way. You can just really grasp those opportunities to learn and grow from their messes and their mistakes every time that you get or every time possible. But if you're in a rut of doing everything for your children, it it doesn't make you a bad person by far, just give yourself permission to be human. I know when I started working as a school counselor, they really followed the love and logic discipline program at the school. 
And it was amazing. It really talked to us about the benefits of allowing your child to your children to learn from mistakes. And that's definitely true in the school setting as well. Um, but one thing that came up in the Love and Logic was helicopter parents versus drill sergeant parents. So that helicopter um, would scoop up and help their kids. Like if they forgot something and they needed it at school, the, the parents would just drive there and go get them or and kind of scoop them out of trouble. And drill sergeants were parents were the ones that didn't support their kids at all. So either one, either end of that continuum isn't um, the best. It's best to be in the middle. Be very supportive, but yet still allow your child to really grow in that independence realm. One thing, though, when you do this, you want to make sure that you do your best to have a positive attitude and lots and lots of empathy. I know Love and Logic, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Love and Logic is really big on empathy, and it works. I know this from an educator perspective. I know this from a therapist perspective, and especially from a parent perspective, but also a personal perspective. If you feel like someone cares, oh my goodness, it's like a whole different situation. So with our kids, it may sound something like this. It must be really hard to know that you did your entire project and you didn't have it in class. Now you're going to get late on it. I know how hard you worked on it. So notice I wasn't saying, oh, I hope you learned your lesson or what lesson did you learn or, or go into teaching mode there. Just merely really connecting and noticing what the child's feeling. That way the child can focus on the situation and still have that feeling of support but learn from the situation. But this can really um, be be tempting to use some sarcasm like, yeah, I bet you won't do that again, or um, how'd that work for you? That can totally turn it the other way and strain your relationship with your child. So if you connect with your child, <clears throat> excuse me, I um, we had the flu here in this little cough in my throat has been lingering. If you connect with your child in an empathetic way, or in grad school, um, I heard the professor refer to it as empathic. Actually, I think it's optional. I'm not sure about that. But it leaves them in a way that they feel like, hey, my mom or my dad, they get it. And then they can focus on that piece of, I'm not going to let this happen again. But if you go into lecture mode, they kind of focus on you rather than the actual um, issue. Or if you go to scooping them up mode, such as, oh, you know what? I'm going to just shoot the teacher a quick email and let him or her know that you did the project and maybe they won't um, count you off. You don't want to do that either. That's the helicopter parent. You want the child to realize that, hey, I made a mistake and go into problem solving mode. When I was a school counselor, we got to go to this conference, which was amazing. It had Colin Powell, Laura Bush, and um, there were several other people there. I'm not thinking of their names right now. But um, one person there was Zig Ziglar. It was older before he, he died. Um, but he has the best quote, um, and it is, when the student is ready, the teacher will teach. And that is so true. How many times have you been like recommended a book or a show or some piece of source of information and you didn't accept it in the beginning, but and when the time was right, you read it. It's like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I need to know. So let your child experience that. Let them be ready for those lessons and let life be their teacher. When our children are allowed to make mistakes and learn from their experiences, the cognitions, which are their thoughts, you may remember that from the EMDR episode, their thoughts that are embedded in about their self-perception is... Maybe I am capable and also I am competent. I can do this. I can do difficult things. I can solve problems. It's okay to try even if I'm not sure if I'll make it. 
All of these things are helpful ways for your child to really be able to dare to follow their dreams. And that's what we want for them. We don't want them to stay in the easy cheesy zone. We want them to go out there and and try their best and sometimes fail and sometimes make it and really just work hard. And really know that the only people that don't make mistakes are the ones that, that they're not trying. So it's really important to kind of have that perception of mistakes are healthy. Some opportunities to make mistakes are maybe learn how to tie shoes. And I'm just saying that because I remember when my children were learning to tie their shoes, oh my goodness, the frustration levels would get high and sometimes there'd be tears and so upset. And I remember thinking, gosh, just let me tie it because I'm really good at it and then we could be gone. But if you allow them to learn how to tie their shoes, they feel that, hey, mom or dad, they believe in me. And that is helps them to create that, well, I believe in myself feeling too. Also, some more opportunities. Let them make lunches. Let them make a mess. Let them make their own bed. Let them forget their homework. Let them make those social errors that they kind of um, feel that impact of can't remember what comedian it was um, we were watching it's maybe a couple years ago but it was something and I'm going to kind of mess it up because I don't have all the details in my memory of this but uh, he had a daughter that's eight years old and he was saying he'd tell her to brush her teeth brush her teeth brush her teeth like a broken record but he kind of felt, realized that hey if all of her other friends tell her to brush her teeth and it's like in that experience of Um, It's not just me telling her that life is um, kind of uh, letting her know. Then she's more likely to brush her teeth. So that's kind of a little bit of a maybe a firm way to do it. But it's it's the fact of let life um, help teach those lessons. Also, there is some great verbiage in the child-parent relationship therapy manual really that choice language, like if you choose to brush your teeth in one minute, then you're choosing to watch your show or read read this before bed or whatever it is. You really, that main concept of being, your choices have consequences, um, whether good or bad. And then, you know, kids are kids, they'll push limits. Um, That child-parent relationship therapy is so good, though, because it really gives us that verbiage to make it simple, clear, and effective. I love that. I uh, talk to parents about that all the time. One of the huge benefits of making a mistake, especially for children, is when they get to develop their own problem-solving skills. I remember as a school counselor, I made a train out of poster board. It was a little rough. I think I... I googled image is of a train and then I tried to duplicate it on a poster board. I like to do that kind of stuff, but it still would look a little rough. <laughs> but on each train car, I put one of the four problem solving steps. So sometimes I'd even be on the phone with a parent and a parent would kind of like be in a situation and then I'd run them through the problem solving steps or or like if you run into someone in the cafeteria and they have a problem like, oh, um, they wouldn't let, let me play at recess or, you know, whatever the problem was. You just run it through the step one was uh, what is your problem? Um, really defining it's important because if you don't define it, then, you know, the rest of them are, are not going to work. You got to have that clarity. The step two, what have you tried? Step three, what else can you do? And step four, what is your next step? We learned that problem solving um, model in graduate school and it was in one of the textbooks. I can't remember which one, but I have used that so many times, both for myself, my kids, um, in the school setting and in the therapy setting. It empowers kids. It really helps to put their life in their own hands, which is what we want our kids to do. We're helping to grow responsible, independent human beings. Okay, so one of the very 
I feel like appropriate metaphors that really speaks to this is like if you don't use your muscles in a while, they kind of deteriorate. Or if you don't use them at all, they don't get a chance to grow. So I remember when I was in the Army, I was in um, airborne school. And I broke my leg. Oh my goodness. When I think back at it now, there's not much emotional charge. But I remember thinking at the time that my life dream had been shattered. I wanted to be airborne in the Army. And now I had this broken leg in my fibula bone. Oh, woe is me. But... When and this is totally irrelevant that part of it, <laughs> but I guess it is because I was um, just talking to um, a client a few weeks ago about that power of perception. You know, um, sometimes things seem really intense in the moment, but as your mind processes it, if there's not um, a lot of underlying stuff in other ways, or if it's not too big of a trauma, your mind can process through things and you, and you can get it kind of leave it in your past. Well, anyway. I kind of got off on a tangent there. I had this big, long cast on my leg at Fort Benning. And then my parents came to pick me up at um, Martin Army Hospital. And I wore this cast for 30 days. And every time I'd sit down, it was like straight. So my my leg was like sticking out. It was like crazy. I, I, I uh, felt so goofy. But anyway, um, when they took this cast off... I remember the day when they cut it off. It was stinky because, you know, the sweat and everything like that. Like you needed to know that, right? But when they took it off, the cat, the muscles had really kind of, really kind of gotten kind of deteriorated, it seemed like. And I have one leg that looked pretty strong because I was in airborne school. And I just went through basic training and all this. So my legs were pretty strong. Um, had lots of muscles in my left leg. But when they took that cast off, only 30 days later, the other leg was, like, noticeably, it, at first I thought it looked skinnier. So I was a little excited. I don't know why. But I, I thought, oh, man, did it? lose weight in that one leg but really it was like um that muscles had deteriorated and everything needed to be built back up so long story short helping our kids make mistakes really helps them to build those problem solving muscles it helps them to hone those skills that they can really draw on um, for their whole life when the other stuff comes up stuff that comes up in adolescence stuff that comes up young adulthood stuff that comes up all throughout life they can have that confidence that competence and that skill level to solve problems so helping helping our kids to learn from these experiences and allowing them to make mistakes is actually a huge gift huge huge gift to them but it's not always easy so this topic really lends itself to the area of high expectations. Our kids really can sense what we feel like they can do and can't do. So if our child has um, some type of learning disability or a physical disability or any kind of limitation at all, I think it's really important to still hold those high expectations within reason, you know, really kind of um, uh, allow your child to have that room to be able to stretch and go out of their comfort zone, but nothing that's unrealistic expectations. Les Brown says, shoot for the moon, and even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. I heard another variation of this quote when I was in high school at um, Titusville High School. They had us read Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I think he said something like, hit your wagon to a star, and if it was something like that, it was close to it. But um, if you if you miss and you'll land in the moon, that type of thing, which I, I think is exactly opposite of the other one. I think I just missed up messed up Ralph Waldo Emerson's quote. So discard that. <laughs> All right. So if we do hold our kids to high expectations, such as doing chores or reading reading a book every two weeks. I love that. If you can have your child read, it can help them in huge ways because that's really one of those skills that they not only need across the curriculum and all the subject areas, you got to read to do math, got to read to do science. It also really enhances their verbal ability 
and it gives them ability to communicate in a stronger way. So, you know, having that high expectation of, okay, in our family, everybody reads a book every two weeks or every four weeks. Just as long as you really make that reading a priority, then they'll make it a priority. It'll be what they know. That'll help them get that courage to apply for scholarships or have that courage of, oh, I can do hard things. I can eat this broccoli that kind of makes me want to um, gag. You know, I love broccoli myself. But I'm just thinking of some kids that I know. You know, really give them that high expectations. Let them know that you believe in them and they will then um, believe in themselves more. And also, um, one area that really, really allows for growth in this area are science projects. Science projects can be so very stressful, at least it was in my family. And um, tempers can kind of go off, tolerance levels are low, um, things get messed up. It really can, really can give you an opportunity to make some mistakes, use those emotional regulation skills, learn calming skills. There's so much opportunity for learning in those but it is hard. But when we do that, when we have high expectations for our kids, we really send them that message that, hey, I believe in you. I know you can do this. And when they make a mistake, using that empathy gives them that like unspoken permission to try again. We don't want our kids to make a mistake and think, oh, that's something I can't do and then just give up. We want them to be uh, persevering and try over and over and over and over again. I know when Ford, Henry Ford, was really um, coming up with the the model of the engine, which, you know, highly, highly successful, he made tons of mistakes for years. And his engineers made mistakes, but he kept kept on trying, just kept on trying over and over again. And that's what we want for our kids. We want them to really be able to follow their dreams even when things don't line up you know easy and when do they line up easy remember as we raise these little small human beings as we refer to as our children we're really given opportunities to help them be the best that they can be so we want to grasp those opportunities every chance that we get so running their homework or lunch to school that they forgot or allowing them to sit in front of video games all weekend disconnected from the family because they've had a hard week that really doesn't help them at all it may seem like it on the surface but it really makes things harder for them it actually hinders them so I know I've told the butterfly story before in another podcast episode on children are like butterflies but I think it's really fitting here to that thought of when a butterfly is developing, it goes through some really tough stuff. And my friend Robert Cox that has um, speaking to autism podcast or listening to autism podcast, if you're listening to this, Robert, sorry about that. But listening to Autism Podcast, he really, he had Mindful Recovery Podcast before. He talked about how the caterpillar is actually, it, it will turn into like a gel. And then it will form into that butterfly. So there's a lot, a lot of pain and struggle involved into really being able to make that transformation. And I'm really using that as a metaphor from transforming from um, a child, a baby, toddler, child, adolescent into um, young adulthood and so on and so on. So if we try to take away that butterfly struggle, going back into the metaphor, by clipping its cocoon and letting it fall out really easy, it doesn't get the blood to its wings and it never flies. So we don't want to do that for our children. We want to make sure they have the struggle so they get the blood to their wings and they can fly. I first heard that story in my child parent relationship therapy training, which I will put a link in the show notes to that manual. I love that type of therapy. Um, it brings really good for adoptive families, but um, families in crisis, good, good, good stuff. But it, it, it brings that um, notion of, okay, we don't have to make things easy, cheesy for our kids because that really hurts our kids. We want to make um, situations and we want to have a real good quality um, life, but we want to allow them to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes every chance we get. So 
I remember watching the Magic School Bus with my kids. I think I love those kids shows more than my kids did. Reading Rainbow or Magic School Bus and um we loved Barney when they were little. I wonder, like, if you guys are in the Facebook group, Parenting in the Rain Community, hop in there and kind of um, put what your favorite shows were when your kids were little or if they're little now. Uh, mention that. But Miss Frizzle used to say, take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. That's because Miss Frizzle knew. She knew this concept of allowing your children to make mistakes is super healthy. So allowing our children to make these mistakes, allowing them to dare to follow their dreams actually gives them confidence and courage and lets them live the best life that they can live. All right, so be sure to check us out on Facebook, Parenting in the Rain Community, and also um, join Play Therapy Community too. I will meet with you on the next episode as the host of Play Therapy Community. And if you're on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter at Jackie Flynn RPT, like Registered Play Therapist. I'm also on Pinterest, but I, I don't do much in there. I want to, but um, time has been like super cramped lately as I'm growing my private practice. Uh, if you're an iTunes user, I would love it if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed the podcast. That way you get like a little alert if you have an iPhone or iPad. You get a little alert that um, I've uploaded a new episode when I have. And if you're, um, st I'm also on Stitcher Radio and a gazillion other places. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care.